The Women's Leadership Institute in the Auburn University College of Liberal Arts is pleased to present Leaders Educating Through Discussion. We hope you will take a moment after you watch our presentation to add your own voice to the dialogue on our website, auburn.edu slash women's leadership. I've been in the Air Force for, uh, for 18 years. Actually, just had my 18th anniversary uh, just a couple of days ago because I actually entered active duty on my birthday. So, which is, so, so I can't forget the day that I entered active duty. But I have been in for, for 18 years and um, what I do as far as a career field is uh, I'm a special agent with uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And if you've never heard of AFOSI, everyone's heard of the TV show uh, NCIS? Okay, so AFOSI is the Air Force version of NCIS, but uh, I have very little criminal background or drug investigation, so, um, so my background has predominantly, you know, has been in counterintelligence and counterterrorism, so a lot of my work um, has been done overseas. Um, I'm currently stationed over at Maxwell. Um, I'm actually teaching over at the graduate school, but it's a out of command type of assignment, so it's not really what I do for a living, but it's just something um, that they asked me to do for about three years, and then I go back to my, my typical career field. Um, I have a presentation lined up, but it, I will say right up front that the slides are very, very busy. It is not my intent to go over all the slides, um, but if you're interested in, in the information, I do have them out as a, ha um, as, a, as a handout. But what I'd like to do is just to kind of go over the presentation for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then really would like to kind of open it up for, for Q&A if you guys have any you know, follow-up questions. Okay, sorry, I'm not a I'm not a Mac person, so uh, so bear with me. Okay, so um, these are topics I would like to discuss today. Just some significant gender legislation that almost everyone in here is going to be familiar with. Uh, just a little quick history of women in the military. Um, go over some um, some DoD gender statistics. I think Robin actually mentioned the 14 percent, so I'll kind of go into that a little bit. Um, but the topic that I really want to talk about is uh, the policy issue that is going on and has been going on for quite some time, which is specifically women in combat. And um, it, it was a policy issue that President Obama, during his, uh, his pitch for the presidency, was an issue that he said that he would address. And he actually is addressing it now that uh, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell has been repealed. So uh, again, that's a topic that's kind of kind of near and dear to my heart for the past three years. So we'll kind of kind of get into it as far as what some of the issues have been and probably what will happen um, in, in the near, near future. Okay, so um, again, this is just a recap. It's not again, it's not meant to be public administration 101 or military history 101. But I would probably say that as far as some significant legislations in the past, uh, the one that I just kind of want to want to highlight, at least for this particular slide, uh, just has to do with that back in 1969, um, um, the executive order actually added, um, actually in 67 added gender as a form of discrimination. And a lot of folks are familiar with the um, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Actually, that did not include gender. Um, that happened in 1972, but as far as from um, the federal government side, it was added as a form of discrimination in 67, and then in 69, um, the federal government actually uh, opened up equal opportunity, you know, for, for the federal government, which of course the military, you know, falls under the federal government. So that's actually kind of why I highlight that particular bullet. Then when you get into the Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1962, that is probably the act that really made the um, the platform for for women's rights as, as we know it as we know it today so the 60s kind of segued it, into it and the reason why I point this particular um, act out is even though discrimination is is not is obviously prohibited uh, you know there is one ex exception where the military kind of falls under which is why I'm highlighting it and that is if they can prove that a that gender could be a bona fide occupational qualification um, that would prohibit women from, from serving. You know, and there's been a lot of Supreme Court cases on it uh, to prove that. But what's interesting about this um, is the fact that you can't use assumptions. And a lot of the issues with women in combat, which I'll get into a little bit later, are based on assumptions. So that's why I point that out. Um, you can't use gender stereotypes. Stereotypes are being used from, from you know, preventing women from serving fully in combat. Um, and the whole, you can't use a preference. You know, like men can't say, well, we don't want to, you know, work with women. So I, I just highlight this out now early in the presentation so when we kind of get into the combat piece, it'll, it'll make a little more sense. Okay, so here's part two to the presentation. It's just a little bit of a background. Um, 
I mean, women have served in the military since forever. But as far as an official presence, that actually did not occur until 1901, and that's when the Army Nurse Corps was established. But, you know, the Army has been, I mean, excuse me, the women have been serving in the military all throughout uh, World War One and uh, World War Two, the Korean War, Vietnam, you know, the whole bit. Um, what I would like to highlight in this particular slide is the fact that um, women weren't allowed to be officers until 1920, so right after World War I. And that was specifically in the nurse corps, but they were capped at major, which is a rank right, right below mine. Um, then in World War II, uh, a lot of folks have seen the movie uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Um, the movie kind of mentions it a little bit, but I'm not sure if you guys have, you know, are familiar with the term WASP. Those were the female pilots, and th they were the, um, the ladies that were responsible for ferrying a lot of the aircraft from the um, airplane manufacturers, you know, to the coast that then, you know, were sent overseas. Um, so they played actually a significant role during World War II. But, um, but really, once the war ended, and in 1948, and that's also when the Air Force became a separate service, that's actually when women were finally granted permanent status in the military. So for women in general, we actually consider 1948 to be our, our birth, I guess, in the military. Even though we've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, but 1948 is, is a significant year for us. Okay, then in 67, um, there were still, you know, legal um, guidelines that indicated that women couldn't, couldn't be, you know, fulfill more than 2% of the military. Um, and, you know, the rank was, again, was capped at major. It wasn't until 67 that that was finally repealed. Um, but again, you know, women still were, you know, in the, in the single digit. Um, you know, I was commissioned through ROTC. That came about in uh, 1969 and then in 1972. So Air Force uh, has always had the reputation for being the most progressive of all the services. Kind of makes sense because we're, we're the newest. Um, so it also makes sense that the Air Force would have the first, you know, ROTC uh, program as far as allowing women. And then um, after the Vietnam War, um, the, the draft basically ended for, for the U.S. So we no longer conscripted um, um, citizens, you know, to, to join the military. So that was, that's probably the second significant moment for, for women in military, and that's when the U.S. military as a whole became an all-volunteer force. So that really opened, um, you know, doors for women to really serve in, in, in almost any, any capacity. At that time, probably about 70, 70 percent. Okay, so uh, in 1976, um, women were first allowed into the service academies. So we're referring to, you know, West Point, um, the Naval Academy, um, as well as the Air Force Academy over in, in Colorado. So with them first entering the service in 76, then of course they graduate four, year, four, you know, four years later. Um, back then, it was a big deal to, to go to the service academy. Actually, it still is a big deal to go to the academy, but as far as making uh, the really high ranks, like general officers or, or admirals, you almost had to come from a service academy, and, and that's why it was significant that women finally were admitted. As far as today's modern military is not as big of a deal. Um, you see folks that are graduating from or getting commissioned from ROTC or um, officer training school that are also now now making the ranks. So again, back then, big deal, maybe maybe not so much um, today. Um, when you guys were children, if you remember, um, you know, hearing about women finally, you know, getting to um, serve in combat as far as being able to fly uh, combat aircraft, um, th that happened right around Desert, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm timeframes. So that was probably the third significant um, aspect of, uh, of women's history, you know, as far as the military. Um, and that was kind of a significant milestone, you know, for us. Um, then, you know, after the, you know, being able to fly in combat, then Congress, you know, repealed the women being allowed to now uh, serve on combat ships. Up to this point, it's always been a law. So up until 1993, it was always a law that prevented women from serving in these combat billets. But in 1993, that is actually when they changed, um, basically kind of, kind of, almost just got rid of the law and basically said it is now up to mm -hmm. DOD. So in this case, the Secretary of Defense. So now any issue that prevents women from serving in a certain position, it is no longer a law issue. Congress does not get involved, except for an oversight standpoint. It is now strictly a policy issue. So you would think that now that it is just a policy issue since 1993, we wouldn't be, you know, having these issues. Well, it's 2012, and you know there are still about 15% um, of billets 
DOD wide that are uh, still exempt, you know, from from women serving. So, but but we're we're, we're getting there. Uh, we actually had some huge milestones just this year alone. Um, the Army actually <laughs> opened up some infantry positions that actually made um, some significant news uh, early this year. And just as recent as about 12 days ago, uh, the Marine Corps, which has the smallest percentage of women, um, actually just admitted the first women into their infantry training. So, I mean, and this is the Marine Corps, so uh, I, mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, they're finally getting on board. But, uh, but what's interesting, which I'll get into a little bit later, it's really not the military that's preventing this. It's actually public opinion that's preventing this. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. Okay, so here's some data that I kind of want to present. Um, I'm also an Auburn um, alumnus. Uh, I just got my PhD last December. Yay for me. And, uh, <laughs> One of my uh, topics that I'm extremely interested in is anything revolving uh, representative bureaucracy. So I am big on explain to me why women make 46.7% uh, of the labor force and why aren't certain career fields that percentage. Because there's always a reason for it. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. That is not at all that I'm implying. But when the numbers don't match up, I'm just one of these people that just want to know why. I mean, that's all. I'm just a curious person, just want to know why. Is there a reason for it? Most of the time, you know, it's, it's a good reason. But what I want to know is if discrimination is involved. That's, that's the key into that. So if you look at the 2010 um, census data, again, you know, women make up 46.7%. And as Robin indicated in her presentation, um, but DOD is only 14.4%. That's both officers enlisted. And I don't know about you, but that makes me go, hmm, why? Why is it only 14.4%? So I broke it down by the four branches of service. And, and as you can see, um, the Air Force is the largest, you know, at 19.2%. But having said that, I don't necessarily think that 19.2% is particularly, you know, laudatory. Like, I don't think I sh we should be jumping up for joy, um, you know, over 19%. Over um, I don't really know what the right number is. Um, I'd love to see it go up to as high, uh, you know, as 25% um, just to get us out of the non-traditional occupation category that the Department of Labor um, categorizes. But, um, you know, I'd like to see that number increase. Like I said, I don't have uh, the right answer. I don't think there is a right answer, but I would just like to see the numbers increase throughout the years. Um, but what I'd also like to point out in this slide is when people think about the military, um, what they see are the general officers or the admirals. I mean, those are the, the military members that have stars, you know, on their ranks. I mean, that's what people look at. Those are like the rock stars um, in the military. So for me, it's kind of alarming that when you then look at the next section where it's bolded, 07 to 010 are the general officer ranks. Um, you know, it, it's, it's disheartening to me to see the percentage of general officers being that low, significantly lower um, for general officers' ranks. Now, you know, there's, there's some reasoning, you know, behind it, um, you know, because most people um, actually, you know, after 20 years in the military, I mean, it's, it's a sacrifice. I mean, it is a commitment. And, you know, when you drag your family around, um, I mean, it's just different for women. Um, I mean, it's just the best way to think. It's just different for us. Um, that, you know, after 20 years, you, you sometimes you just don't want to stay. And, and, and that's okay. Um, and, and that does kind of explain it. Um, you know, I've done some independent research on my own, and even though there is discrimination out there, because there is, there, I mean, there, there absolutely is, um, but, but at least I'm happy to say in general, of course, in general, that I don't think that's the reason that the percentage is, is low, at, at least as far as progressing through the ranks. There's always going to be incidences, um, but as far as why the general officer rank is that single digit, um, I, I really do believe it just has to do with when she hit that certain point, um, you meet retirement, you know, your family's tired, you know, your kids are getting ready to, you know, to enter college. Um, they just really don't want to make that sacrifice, you know, I anymore. So I, I think that's what drives it more. And I can tell you a whole different, you know, research based on single women and married women. But again, that's a totally different, different uh, presentation. Um, what's interesting about, uh, if you look at in the past, you know, 100 years or so, um, you know, we didn't get our first general officer until 1970. And it wasn't even Air Force, which was kind of unfortunate, but that's okay. Um, and then uh, <laughs> the first four-star female general actually didn't even get appointed until 2008. Now, the Army has been around since 17, 
such and such, you know, and um, you know, and since 1948, when women were open to all ranks. So as of 1948, which is considered, you know, the birth of women in the military, I can't believe that it took until 2008 to get the first four-star general. And I am a little disheartened that it was Army, but again, that's, a, that's another story, and I'll have to get over it. Um, <laughs> but our first female Air Force, which is, you know, service that I'm in, actually, she hasn't even been confirmed yet. From, from Congress, she's still a presidential nominee, and that was just this year alone. So, I mean, we're considered like the most progressive of all the services. So, it was, it's interesting how the Air Force just got, you know, or we're on our on our way of getting our first four star. Uh, the Navy does not have a four star female ever, and the Marine Corps also does not have a, a female four star. So, it's only been two two services. So, we we still have ha have a ways to go. Okay. Here's the meat of the presentation. Um, it's, it's women in combat, again, it's, it's, it's a topic that is very near and dear um, to my, um, my um, to for me, partly probably because of what I do you know, for the Air Force. So I just kind of uh, run down a little bit um, of, of, of kind of the history behind it. Um, as I indicated before, up until 1993, it was, there were congressional laws that kept women from serving in, in combat. So, so just keep that in mind when, when I start to cover things prior to 93. But when you look at it, it's, it's almost, I'm not gonna say that it's ridiculous, but it's just interesting what they came up with uh, to keep women from these positions. So in 1982, there's this DCPC. It's a coding to identify positions that should be closed. Nothing more than that, than a group of people that got together. I mean, obviously high-ranking folks. That was it. It was just a tabletop discussion. No PT, no fiscal fitness test, no, no nothing. It was just, what are the positions that we think should be closed to women? So they had this tabletop discussion. They came up with this, it's, it's almost like a statistical analysis tool, um, you know, based on what they do, you know, how, how much time they would be on the battlefield and, and, and so forth. So, so that was one of the first, first steps in, in, in what I would consider keeping women from, from combat. Then in 1988, they came up with this. Again, this is all tabletop, you know, nothing more than tabletop came out with this risk rule. And now they're identifying non-combat positions. So, so positions that, that technically aren't in harm's way, but if they're in proximity <coughs> to these units or these positions that may be in harm's way, you know what, well, w we don't think women should serve in these positions either. So what's interesting about, again, you know, those two, um, two um, aspects of the laws that came out is, it was nothing more than just, just discussion. No, no statistical testing, no actual physical testing, you know, for that matter. It was just a decision, you know, that was made. Okay, so as I stated before, then in 1991, you know, that's when Congress repealed um, the, the law that banned women from serving in, you know, um, combat aviation. And, um, and then two years later, that's when the Secretary of Defense, and again, 1993 is the year when Congress decided, you know what? no more laws, it's now gonna be a matter um, of policy. So you, SECDEF, it's your policy, you decide uh, what positions women can serve and, and what positions women can't. And at that time, that's when he um, opened up all combat aviation you know, for all the services you know, for women. Have you guys heard of uh, Martha McSally? You guys recognize the name? Martha McSally, she retired as a uh, Fulbright Colonel in the Air Force. Um, She's actually the one, um, she actually sued, and her case actually even went to the Supreme Court, but she actually sued the Secretary of Defense at the time because when she was serving in Saudi Arabia, um, DOD mandated that she wear the, the, the covering, the Baya head covering, and she believed that it was against her constitutional rights you know, um, to, to, to wear that. And there was a lot of discussion on it, and what's really interesting is, and this is a part that a lot of people don't realize, the Saudi Arabian government never s told the U.S. government that we want the U.S. women to be in covering. It was the U.S. DOD that wanted DOD women to, to cover up. So, I mean, you gotta kind of almost gotta like peel back the onion to, to, to kind of understand that. And of course, DOD said it was, you know, it was to pr you know, protect the women, um, you know, yada, 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 whatever. But um, do I think there's some truth to it? Yes, I mean, you know, th th there is. But, but it's interesting that it was our own policies that put that in place and not our visiting country, you know, that, that, that was hosting us. But anyway, so she's the one, you know, she definitely made a name for herself by 
suing the government and the federal government for that matter. She did make 06 and, and she really did have a um, successful career. Um, there are fans of hers, including myself, that I really thought that she would make officer ranks because she is also the very first female fighter pilot um, to serve in combat. So that is the other thing that she is known for. Um, so we had hoped that she was going to stay in, but um, I know her personally, and you know she really never said it. Um, she, she's a lady with a lot of grace, but I, I suspect that you know she did her 20 years, and she should be commended, you know, for her 20 years. But you know, my point of bringing her up is she's actually running for for Congress over in, in Arizona. So I, I just wish her best of luck. Her being the first female combat pilot, and and, and so forth. Um, but anyway, so 1993 it now becomes matter of policy. Um, and, and so forth. So, so now that it's policy and no longer um, a law, so DOD came up with um, what is now known as the 1994 Ground Combat Exclusion and Co-Location Policy. So that is still the current policy that we still use today in 2012, so eight, 18 years later. I don't expect you to even understand what I wrote in this slide, but all you need to know about this particular slide is the fact that if you are even co-located or in close proximity to any type of combat billet, women can't serve in it, period, in, end of story. No, no physical testing, not even a, to see if women could fill these positions. It was just a, almost like a blanket um, you know, a policy. So as a result of it, you know, we have 1.4 million active duty billets in all of the um, Department of Defense. And as a result of this policy, women are exempt from serving in about 200,000 positions. Now, this doesn't affect the Air Force as much um, because we're not ground combat per se. But when you start talking about the Army and when you start talking about the Marine Corps, those are the individuals that are getting promoted. So if you're going to exempt women from serving these positions, you're also affecting their ability you know, to, to get promoted, which, which isn't right you know, a, 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 as well. So this is why it's kind of been a hot topic, because it's, it's just policy. I mean, it's just worse. No one's even testing. Like, no one's even allowing to see if you know, women can fill these positions. So, um, so that is why it's just been just kind of a, kind of a, um, a, a, sen a sensitive topic. So the main argument, so I've done a lot of research on this. Uh, I mean, I'm really encapsulated it very quickly into like 15, 20 minutes, but this is like three years <laughs> worth of research. But basically, there's just been three standard arguments um, for, for why um, they shouldn't change the current policy. You know, so the first is um, lack of physical strength. You know, and, and my counter argument to that is, well, how do you know if you're not even going to test us? because you're just basing it on a written, written policy. And the way I look at it is, you know, generally speaking, yes, women, as far as upper body strength, um, are, are not as, as strong as men. But we all know, because I know for a fact that every single one of you guys in here know some women that can kick anyone's butt and then some and twice on Sunday, right? <laughs> just like there are some men who also can't, can't do it. You know, so the way I look at it is, why not just put on even playing field for those certain combat billets. I mean, that's kind of what, what I've been advocating for. So, so why not test it? You know, why, why have the blanket no, why, and why not have a test? Okay, so that's the first argument, which, which just doesn't fly. Um, okay, the second one is the fact that, well, you know, by women having in these really close quarter um, units, you know, they're going to affect unit cohesion and um, overall effectiveness and just the unit morale. Um, there have been so many studies on that that has debunked that theory. It, it's, it's really not even worth worth getting into. I mean, it's just it, it's just a very old um, mindset to, to to think that way. And women have been around so long that even the men would tell you, "Yeah, we, we don't care if she can do the job. We we don't care." And, and that's really the, kind of the mindset of the men in the service. Um, most men in the service. Okay. And then the third argument and. And, the, and it's the third argument that's been carrying the most weight. And this is where public opinion has really kind of swayed, um, I believe, the Secretary of Defense. And that's just that some people just don't believe, or a lot of our, the American populace just doesn't believe that you know, women belong in combat. Um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, senators and, and congress um, persons you know, are, are saying that their constituents just don't want to see women in body bags. Um, they don't want to see women um, being captured as you know, persons of war, you know, POWs, um, the the American populace, you know, can't handle you know women being raped out in the battlefield. 
Well, here's the thing. We've already brought women home in body bags since Desert Storm. Um, women have been captured as POWs, and, uh, and I'm sorry, women have been raped, but guess what? So have the men. Um, it, it, is, it is a uh, war, is, is a horror, and those things that I just mentioned is, is, is a horror of war, but it affects both, both genders. And the military is an all-volunteer force. You know, women, you're not being rec recruited and you have to do it. I mean, these are women that are signing up, so if they want to serve their country, they kind of know what they're, what they're getting them, th themselves into. So why are we not giving them the opportunity um, to, to apply for, for any, any position. That's, you know, that's kind of the position. Okay, so why is this 1994 policy obsolete? Well, part of it is the fact that um, the way we fight wars is completely different. Um, you know, in the military, we have this term called a linear battlefield, and what that means is you know, it's like crossing a line, bad guys on that side, good guys on this side, okay? Last time we fought a war like that was during the Cold War. And you know, in certain aspects of Desert Shield, Desert Storm, warfare today is 360 degrees. Um, it, it can be actually in a safe area, I mean, because you, know, you can have um, you know, IEDs or you can have you know, rockets that, just, that can actually access us you know, at, at a particular camp. Um, the people who were at most risk during um, over in Iraq and Afghanistan weren't even necessarily the direct action teams. I mean, they were uh, absolutely, but you had the truck drivers. They were at risk every single day from having to go from like a safe zone through an unsafe zone to get to th the next safe zone, um, and, and they're just truck drivers, which is a commendable position. But my point is, is that really almost any job that you're in, if you're outside the wire or inside the wire, you're, you're put in harm's way. So you can't use the, the, that definition, that 1994 definition that still wants to use the linear battlefield as how we fight wars, because we absolutely do not fight wars that way. So you need to come up with a more current definition. It's kind of what we're saying to, to the Secretary of Defense. Um, and then also, if you look at what women have done in Iraq and in Afghanistan, um, it is absolutely commendable, as well as the servicemen. So I certainly don't want to delineate between the men and women, but they, both men and women, have done outstanding, outstanding, you know, in the service. Um, I would say that for the Army and for the Marine Corps, and God bless them too, because those general officers, which which are the men, they are very creative. <laughs> because, again, it's not the military that's really fighting this. I mean, the general officer saying, like, we're, we're, we're okay, you know, bring them in. So during um, Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom, which is over in, in both in Afghanistan and Iraq, what these general officers did is they just, they came up with these teams to augment these direct action teams, or they came up with loopholes um, so women could still play a part because they knew that they needed women. I mean, even the obvious um, example would be searches. Um, because of the cultural sensitivities over in both Iraq and Afghanistan, you couldn't have a man, you know, search a woman. This is, you know, for the civilian, the local populace or whatever. So you have to have other women with these, these teams to search women. I just use that as, as one example. You know, you have to have women, or a lot of the women are in the medical field, so you have to have combat medics that they actually couldn't serve. So they came up with ways where they could just be attached to the unit, but not really attached to the unit. Do you know what I mean? So even with this... Uh, with this 1994 policy, we've been doing it anyway. We've been doing it since 2002, quite frankly. So why not just kind of get get rid of the policy and, and, and actually make it legal, um, or from not legal because it's just a policy, <coughs> but just to have the policy kind of more, you know, uh, uh, updated. So the recommendation that um, a lot of folks that are kind of fighting this fight, to include myself is we're basically saying to rescind the co-location policy because by doing that, you immediately open up 80,000 of those 200,000 positions. Just by saying something absurd as, well, if you're even close to them, women can't serve. So if you, so we first rescind that policy, boom, we've now resolved at least half, half, half the issues. Um, the second issue is, um, or the second recommendation is to adopt gender neutral um, criteria. Like I said, we have positions where fiscal strength is a huge um, requirement. 
no one is dis disputing it. No one is disputing it. We're not saying, we're not asking for separate standards for, for those special specialized positions. What we're asking for, same standards, but let us try to compete for those same standards. Because right now, the policy is saying that we can't even apply. So that would be the second recommendation is to um, just have it gender neutral. If, if a female can, can meet the physical requirements, then why can't she serve? I mean, plain and simple. Why can't she have the same standards as the other guys? You know, for those specialized. Um, and then that will probably account for probably the other remaining 50,000 positions. And then the third recommendation would be just to flat out um, also rescind the, the ground combat exclusion policy. And again, that's where the definition of that linear battlefield just, just doesn't make sense because, you know, we, we just don't fight, you know, worse, worse that way. So we're, we're getting there. So if you recall from my couple of slides ago, um, you know, the Army is, uh, they're opening up certain positions more. So it opened up like 10 to 15,000 positions for women. Um, I am so impressed with what the Marine Corps has done, as, you know, opening up women. Actually, the first class starts in, in May. In fact, they might have even already started. But I do know that it was in May of, of this year. Um, and again, and it is a topic that President Obama did say that he was going to address. And in the time that he's been in office, I can honestly say that he has addressed it in, in some form or, um, or matter in a, in a very positive way. So um, I would like to see this completely be, um, I'm not gonna use the word fair per se, but at least for this particular topic, I'd love to see this resolved while I'm still on active duty. Um, I don't think it's gonna happen. I could be hopeful because um, I really don't want to be on active duty for really more than five more years, but, uh, uh, but, you know, but we'll see. But, but I think we are you know, making, making segues, and, and I think the American populace, just based on public opinion polls, I think they're starting to really kind of embrace more um, you know, women's contribution um, you know, into the military. So, so we're, get, we're not there yet, but, uh, but we're getting there. So anyway, said a lot of stuff in, in a short amount of time, and um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to uh, entertain it at this time. Okay. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, um, what you think it would do to the numbers if your recommendations were followed, what kind of a, a raising up of percentage of women serving do you think it would do? What would that get at? Um, well, okay, so if you so if we were to adopt that first policy, that would immediately open up, you know, eighty thousand positions. Um, so, you know, so right off the bat, I mean, how many women would probably serve there? You know, probably, I would say probably about 10%. I think what this would do would, I, I don't think the, um, it wouldn't be obvious mm -hmm. immediately. It would be more of a future return, if that makes sense, because by lifting this, this would change recruitment like you would not believe. Um, women would just be more open into potentially wanting to join, you know, join the service. Because uh, most people hear about the Navy SEALs. I mean, everyone heard about Navy SEAL, you know, with Obama. Most people are familiar with um, the Ranger, Army Rangers, um, uh, Marine Recon, um, and, 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 you know, teams like that. So the return wouldn't be immediate, but we would, we would get the future return and the future gain um, a, a little bit later on. But I think it's more, um, I think it's the principle more than really the numbers. Is it just doesn't make sense today in 2012, after what all the women have done in Iraq and Afghanistan, why is there still a limitation? I mean, that's really what the issue is. Um, for me, um, don't ask, don't tell was long overdue, and everyone kept on saying, okay, I'm not trying to t turn this into a political d debate, so I apologize if, if, I, if I am. But everyone who was against it thought, you know, swarms of people would get out and there would be this mass, you know, crisis. Yeah, zip, nothing has happened since, since it was uh, rescinded last year. Um, so I think it's more the, this is an all volunteer force. If, if women are capable, why are we preventing them? Um, it really has now become more a matter of principle. It will increase the numbers, but not dramatic. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, ma'am. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, I do, I do. That is a, a great question. Um, there are a handful of countries that the military is open carte blanche. Um, all positions are, are open to men and women. Um, the Israeli military, uh, should be no surprise, uh, but they have always been 
we don't we don't care whoever can do the job can can do the job um, there's also um, one of the Asiatic countries um, God, I want to say that it's Malaysia um, is, is, is the other one there's, there's actually like five or six uh, Denmark I believe is, is one Switzerland I think, believe is the fourth and I can't remember the, the, the other two but there there is already some international presence there that, that has completely opened up and and they've actually kind of supported us you know um, on, on on this on this mission um, but you know we'll, we'll see how it goes Mm -hmm. Or if it just kind of depends on okay. like, their size and, and Sure. Um, the, the way uh, physical fitness is done right now for the military is, is there is a separate standard for men and women. Um, and a, as it should be, because you know what, if you talk about just a generic military job, there's, there's nothing, if you remember um, the, uh, the, um, the 1972 Equal Employment Opportunity Act, I talked a little bit about that um, BFOQ. Um, I mean, so we have law that actually says that there has to be a reason why you want to have these fiscal standards. So the average normal job in the military, there, there is no reason for it. Because the truth of the matter is that the women are built different than the men. So you do have to recognize that and then we have law to support it. So, so there are different standards for men and women and it's broken up by age category. That's how we set the standards. So it's not really more size, it's more age category. But specifically for women in combat, I'm talking about specifically those billets that there is some physical strength involved. So those, so those are the positions that I would say um, we should put fiscal standards and no one is arguing, it, arguing with, with, with that argument. And for those positions where fitness does have a, a, a heavier role in being able to do that job, not a problem with having the same standard. So that's kind of our position on that. Okay, yes ma'am. When you started in your service, were you aware of these issues or did you just come across them as you chose to move up? Um, you know, I think when I first joined the military, well, first of all, I was supposed to be a boy when I was born. <laughs> um, so my dad raised me as a boy, okay? So I will say that. So I'm already a tomboy by, by nature. And, but I was also raised, um, you know, with parents that basically told me that I can do whatever I want. You know, that I mean, that I should be able to strive, you know, for anything. So I will admit that I probably joined the military a little naive, you know, in that. Um, you know, and, I, and I've had a couple of incidences, um, you know, but, but, they're, but they're minor. I mean, it's nothing to, you know, write a book, you know, a book about or whatever. Um, and it's not even really anything to just kind of, kind of, kind of mention. Now, I will say, with the caveat that this is not the right answer, but I'm, I'm only speaking about myself. You know, being a woman in the military, you, you just have to have a thick skin. Um, and again, that's still not even the right answer because why should we st be subjected to it? But, but the truth of the matter is, is that, I mean, you just have a thick skin. And, um, and I guess because a lot of my friends are guys, I mean, certain things just don't, they just don't bother me. But, but that's still not right either. You know, and, and I can admit that. You know, I mean, I, c I can admit that. Um, you know, there's that fine line between you've gone over um, and then there's that fine line of, you know, so I know when the incident has gone over and I have always addressed it throughout my career. But for those that are, you know, I mean, normally I just kind of take them to the side and have a couple of choice words with them and, um, and it normally kind of kind of fixes itself. Um, I mean, generally speaking, most women, excuse me, most men in the military are very supportive of, of I mean, of women in the military. Um, I mean, the way they look at it is, is that we're brothers and sisters in arms. If you can do the job, that's all they care about. Um, and that is the overwhelming, you know, majority. So again, I've had minor incidences. Um, and again, that's not to say that there aren't, there have not been, because the truth of the matter is that there have been discrimination. But just me personally, all of mine have been very, very minor. Yes, ma'am. Um, I feel like there was a lot of debate around this issue in mm -hmm. like 97, mm -hmm. like 97 and 99. Are you aware of anything that was going on at that particular time that would have caused this, like, that read back on the poor practice time? That was probably, it was, um, around that time we were fighting the war, uh, with the NATO war over at Kosovo and Bosnia. Um, 
I don't know if, if God, you know, I'm trying to remember. So I, was, I just joined the military then, and um, that's the only thing that kind of comes, comes to mind. But, but honestly, it's just a topic that gets brought up. I mean, anything involving public policy or anything that involves, you, you know, the government, um, it just takes a congressperson or, or, or you know, a political individual or maybe even a lobby group that just, you know, wants to kind of bring it up again. But what I suspect is because the, um, the ban against women from serving in combat aviation and combat ships finally got lifted in 91 and then DOD starting in 93, I suspect, if I remember correctly from my research, a lot of the lobby groups just kind of wanted to continue that role, that, you know, that progressive role. Um, and I think we saw a lot of um, action in 96, 97. Now, it did die down. But then when 9-11 hit, it started all over again. And it's definitely starting now because women have already proven themselves um, in those two theater operations. And then you have a president who has the courage to tackle it from, from his level. So that's the reason why it's really now getting, um, getting attention. So, OK, anything else? OK, yeah. So in the other branch, Mm -hmm. in the Air Force and stuff. Um, so when, let's say, a man joins, joins the Marine Corps mm -hmm. um, and goes in open general for his job, um, can he be automatically placed in a combat job, like, without volunteering for that no. job? No. Okay, he has to... Yes, so a lot of these specialized positions um, that um, a lot of these... Those positions are what I refer to as direct action teams, and those are like the SEALs and things like that. Those are all special duty assignments. So you don't get appointed a SEAL. You have to apply to be a SEAL, um, just like to, you know, to be a ranger or whatever. So, and they do have a fiscal requirement. So they still have fiscal, um, so they also have to meet the threshold. I just don't like the fact that right off the bat, they've said that women can't even, can't even do that test. Th that's my issue. Um, so those teams, actually there is, a fiscal requirement. So even the men, so they volunteer, hopefully they get accepted to try out, and then they go through that excruciating um, training you know, that we all hear about, which, which does exist. Um, and all, like, um, so, so yes. So even regular infantry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just flat out? Yeah, they all have, all of those teams have varying levels of uh, fitness requirements, so they're all different. You know, like the Navy SEALs is considered to be like one of the most rigorous. Um, Army infantry, from based on my study, theirs is actually pretty rigorous, but not nearly as rigorous as the SEALs, whatever. But there is that basic physical requirement okay. that they, yes, they can apply, but they still have to meet that requirement and still have to pass. So even if the Air Force adopted or changed the policy for women in combat, mm -hmm. I would still have to say, I would. Like oh yes, to you still have to volunteer, um, right? Okay, so I didn't. I got the direct part of mm -hmm. it, but I didn't really understand. Right. How yeah, it was this would be. This would be completely voluntary because the truth of the matter is, is that there are some women, there are also some men that don't want to be a part of these direct action teams. We're not asking you to because it's completely voluntary for you to apply for these specialized positions. All we're saying is, but why can't it be an open playing field as far as to apply without having an arbitrary policy that says no? And I will say, and this is a part that really annoys me, so I'm glad you brought this up. So you guys have heard of the term, you know, special forces? Okay, so in the Air Force, Okay, one of the, one of the um, prohibitions is the fact that any, any special force unit can't have any women. There's a blanket statement that says that any billets that is attached to a special force unit, a, a female cannot serve. Well, guess what? We have weathermen, and they are weathermen because we have no weather women in, in, in a special force unit. So someone who just briefs the weather, if they're attached to a special force unit, a woman can't serve. Um, you can have a female in the Army, the uh, Apache helicopter is the combat, um, well, helicopter in the Army. Plenty of women that have flown the Apache helicopter, but if that Apache helicopter unit is attached to a special force unit, yep, she can't fly. So that's that arbitrariness that I'm having a hard time stomaching um, and so forth. So for the Air Force, because we are the most progressive of all the services, um, we only have about, um, God, I mean, it's, it's in the single digits um, for the Air Force that the women can't serve in, and, and they're all Special Force billets, and that's the reason why. So they're not, so some of those positions aren't even physically demanding. It's just a fact that they are a Special Force unit a female can't serve. But they have, because they've 
because the general officers, these smart general officers, have come up with loopholes. But we need to get away from the loopholes and just do it, you know, legit is, 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 is my take. Yes, ma'am. No. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't affect your pay. So I may have misheard you, but um, you say that most um, women will quit because of like family reasons rather than discriminatory reasons? Um, well, I wouldn't use the word quit. And if I did okay. use that, I apologize because that's not what I meant. I guess what I was getting at was um, in order to retire in the military, um, uh, the minimum requirement is, is 20 years, unless you, unless you retire medically, and that's a different story. But the average military individual, you are eligible to retire at 20 years. So, f so for me, I'm at 18 years, and I could technically retire in, in 20 years. So I'm an 05, so that's a lieutenant colonel. Um, so my next rank would be 06, would be, uh, which is referred to as a full bird colonel. Well, I would have to consciously make the decision to stay beyond 20 to even meet that 06 board. Um, so that's why I say that I think that's the reason why the numbers really taper off. Uh, it tapers off for the men too, but it's obvious for, for the women. So I guess what I was just saying is that because you are eligible to retire at 20, a lot of folks do retire at 20. There's nothing wrong with retiring at 20. You honorably served your country for 20 years. Um, and um, you know, so if, you, so if you get out, but by choosing to get out at 20, um, you're, you're not going to really meet that next board, which is to make 06, which is my next rank, and then the general officers are, are after that. And I guess what I was just suggesting is that um, women more than men will make that sacrifice more to get out at 20 for family reasons. I mean, that's just all that I was implying. So, so I guess for me, what I try to do is convince all my female colleagues to your kids can take care of themselves, your husband can take care of them. You know, you can you know you know kind of continue you know that path. Which I mean, each man or woman has to make the right decision. You know, for for them you know for themselves. And I would never question anyone's decision over what is right for their family. But I will say, as a senior female officer, I would like to see more female officers in the military, and you can't blame me for wanting to talk to my colleagues and trying to get them to stay longer. Do you think part of that is because most of the, of the female officers, when they get that far, do have a tough skin, and so they're not <coughs> as daunted by the loopholes and the legal or policies? Um, I'm sorry, say the beginning part of your question again. You know, um, no one's really done research on this. I mean, you know, if the military ever wanted to pay me to do this research, I would gladly do it. Um, th there is a disparaging, when, you, you know, um, if you look at married women versus unmarried women, it's kind of interesting to see that the single women, if you don't have a family, um, there's not as many sacrifices to make. Do, do you know what I mean? Um, or if you are married but you don't have children, um, you may you don't you don't have that you don't have that hanging over over your head. Um, again, I don't, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that you don't have to make those those decisions. Um, you know, I mean, I'm married. Um, you know, but we, you know, we we don't have any children, and so at 20 years, you know, I don't have that other. You know, like I don't, I, don't, I didn't have kids that you know I missed out on. Um, for, for whatever you know f um, significant events. So for me, when I make when it's time for me to make that decision in two years, I can just honestly make that decision just between me and my husband. Like I don't have to make, I don't have to consider well, where are my kids at you know at, at school. So you know if you look at a lot of the women that are higher ranking, it is interesting to see how so many of them are still single or divorced. You know or divorced or you know, don't have kids and, you know, don't, you know, whatever. And this is a very informal study that, you know, that I did. It's not credible at all. But just based on my limited amount of study, it's, it's interesting, you know, to see that. But I think the statement that I just made, you could probably also apply it to other maybe non-traditional occupations. Um, so I think it's the same, you know, the same, the same spill. But, uh, you know, I guess it is what it is. Yes? 
there a point that you can't reach on the ladder, like as a woman, because of things that you're not allowed to do? Well, it's going to be different for each branch of service. Um, The reason why the Marine Corps doesn't have a four-star general is literally, is be, now the Marines, think about what the Marines do. I mean, they are direct combat all the way. I mean, they are ground combat. Um, to me, it makes sense why the Marines don't have one because they don't allow women, you know, to serve in these positions. So it's gonna be years, you know, before, um, before we see a four-star. They do have female general officers, but they just don't have a four-star. Um, the way the military works is, it depends on what you do in the military. Um, because we have, um, um, I don't even know a civilian way of putting it, but you know we have um, you know like function like well functionals, um, career fields. You know that says you know you're a pilot or like in my case you're an OSI agent, or you work intel, and th that specific job is, is capped at at a certain rank. So like in the Air Force, the, the, a four star general will be a pilot. So the chief of staff of the Air Force will be a pilot because we are you know, after all the Air Force, you know. So it makes sense to be a pilot. <laughs> so you're not going to have a special agent running the Air Force, um, and so forth. So, so then when you look at the Marine Corps, yes, I mean if you have infantry or combat experience, that's how you're going to progress in you know in uh, um, you know in the Marine Corps. Um, I'm not really sure why the Navy hasn't had a, the first four star, but I will admit that I'm not as familiar with the Navy as I am the other services. And with the Army, they have had one, but the Army is also well. When the, well, they've been around since you know 1700s, late 1700s, and uh, um, but their female four stars are you know logistics. Um, um, they're not combat billets, you know what I mean? But but they're also the, our largest branch of service too, so it makes sense why. Well, they have more than we do. So, right, anything else? Okay, well, ladies, I want to thank you very right. much um, for, for having me. And, and again, I do want to thank again the Women's Leadership Institute. I think it's a fantastic program, and, and I think it's absolute laudatory that you ladies, uh, ladies are here. Um, I think it's just great, you know, based on your selection and everything. And saw the syllabus, and it just seemed really, really, really exciting. So I wish all of you guys just the absolute best um, in, in the future and in your future careers. So thank you.